the internet a couple of seconds to catch up on all the broadcast platforms and we are now live welcome everyone to episode six of the level up your wealth podcast i'm one of your hosts marcus howard remember if you click the link at the bottom uh, bit.ly slash game driven brand growth i have free training to show you how to use video games to engage the two-thirds of your community your personal community your your business community that plays video games and i'm joined by marie and our co-host mario mario will you introduce yourself and then we have to speak to marie she's she's just a, a bundle of energy <laughs> so mario Payne in beautiful jacksonville florida uh where it, it's springtime almost in november so just happy to be here and happy to talk to marie and all the fun stuff she's doing awesome thank you so much it's so great to be here um yes i wish it was springtime here it's definitely getting colder so i'm in all like my hoodies and whatnot definitely cozy season so you know i think any of my my friends out there who know that i love you know cozy games i hope we get to talk about that for sure we should you, you can you can teach us something about cozy games but before yes. speaking of cozy games we're going to play a not so cozy game right now all right everybody get your bets in if you're a, a long time fan of the show you know every week we have a 1v1 match of rock paper scissors yes. so this week, Mario is going up against Marie. What we want you to do is, as a friendly wager in the comments, let us know who do you think is going to win this week's matchup. Is it Marie? Is it Mario? Uh, out of the people who select the winner, one of you will win a free digital copy of Mario's book, The Relaxed Investor, and a free digital copy of my book, Innovate Gaming and Esports. So yeah. without further ado, Mario, please share your screen. Everyone, make sure you get your bets in. Let's get this kicked off. All right, so the screen has been shared. So I think Marie has to pop in as my opponent. All right, that's quick match, right? Quick match, yep, quick match. All righty, all righty, here we go. It's like you said no pressure, but there's a lot of pressure. I could be competitive. <laughs> all right, so here we go. Right. So everybody who's seeing this for the first time, this is Rock, Paper, Scissors. You can find it on rps.gg, it's free to play. Shout out to Eugene for helping us uh, get this set up. It's first to 10 points. It's the classic rock, paper, scissors, but in card form, Marie and Mario will both pick their cards. Uh, so when Marie makes her selection, it's gonna show the selections and then either I, one of them will get a point or it'll be a draw, first to 10 points wins. So Marie, go ahead and, and pick your card. Oh, she beat me, okay. Okay, all right, here we go. Here we go, all right. Draw. Uh. Oh wow, this is like lightning round. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm trying to think about my strategies here. Okay, okay. And so Marie, I don't know if you see this. If you look at the bottom of the screen, or I guess the top of the screen on your screen, you can actually see a history of Mario's move. Yeah. Oh, I did not I don't know, know that. that. Makes it easier or or more complicated for you, but he can also see that for you as well. I can. I can. And I am opening up a can of lead here. Oh, oh six my goodness. Four. Oh boy. Okay. Raw, all right. Seven of one. Oh. Marie, we believe in you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, draw. Yes. Match point. Draw. Okay. Draw again. Draw again. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, she's clawing her way back. Oh, what are we doing here? What are, what are we doing here? Yes. All right. So, Marie, so I always, because uh, you know I, I do finances for a living. I'm a you know certified financial planner with my own firm in here in beautiful Jacksonville. So, I would imagine from an investment standpoint, you're probably more aggressive than conservative. Am I right about saying that? Yes. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. So the reason why is because so when you play, as I stop sharing my screen, when you play rock, scissors, paper, so like the rock is more like aggressive, like, it's more aggressive. So typically more person that does more rocks, they're kind of more aggressive. They're more action pack oriented instead of laid back. A person who's more paper and you had like two or three papers throughout the whole match, they're more kind of reserved, kind of more laid back, kind of just go with the flow type. And then, you know, scissors are kind of in the middle where you can be aggressive because you're cutting something, but at the same time you can get smashed. So with your moves, I was looking at, definitely I would think that you're probably more a aggressive person from an investment standpoint or from a decision-making standpoint compared to being more conservative. 
I love that. I had no idea there'd be like so much psychology between my children this year on this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so cool. That is very cool. I mean, I, I just like to keep it punchy. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'm sure that, that, that works very well for you in recruiting, right? And, and again, everybody, as you're joining us live, if you have any questions about recruiting or, or cozy games, as we're about to learn here shortly, um, Marie is, is happy to answer questions. Anything that's financial uh, wealth planning or financial literary, literacy planning, um, Mario can, can do that as well. Marie, can you tell us about cozy games? Yes. Oh, my gosh. I just came from Game Beats Next this week. Um, and I actually was asked this question, like people are like, I have no idea what cozy games is. And I'm like, what? That's amazing. Now I just like, you know, just spent the whole time networking and telling people about cozy games. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, so cozy games, really, they are just games that are wholesome. They're sweet. They're, you know, easy. Um, you know, there's no like battle mechanics, I guess you could say, or like fighting in it. It's really like low stress. You take it at your own pace. Um, and of course, they're fun, right? But there's just a sweet nature to them. And I think it's just so different from what we think video games are, right? Like it's competitive, you know, it's high stakes, it's adrenaline and all of that. Cozy Games is on the complete opposite end. It is take your time, you know, cozy up with your blanket. You know, I was saying earlier that it's like cozy season. So I am just like, yeah, I'm getting all my games ready to just, you know, sit back and relax and unwind and, and all of that. So yeah, that that's pretty much what cozy games are. Everything that you think about in terms of games being, um, you know, hardcore, like cozy games is everything on the softer side. Okay, so the exact opposite of rock, paper, scissors. Exactly. Yes, yes. Nothing punchy, you know, nothing like that. <laughs> so, so what type of games in particular would be deemed as a cozy game? Sure. So um, I think Animal Crossing is probably the most popular. Um, so Cozy Games actually really made its like breakthrough, I think, during the pandemic, right? In 2020, a lot more people were finding um, themselves playing games, but a lot of people were also finding themselves playing something like Animal Crossing or just more cozier games because they were low stakes. They were, you know, more relaxing, more wholesome. But also, I think it was also because of the community. When you think about the community for cozy games, um, it is everything wholesome, right? Like these are where your best friends are, you know, like, again, there's no competition. You're all rooting for each other. It's all about like, um, you know, good feelings and fun. And so, um, yeah, so definitely um, Animal Crossing is, is one of the big ones. Um, I think Stardew Valley, um, most people think of as well. Um, a couple cozy games did come out this year. So like Fay Farm, I see someone mentioned that in the chat. Um, but yeah, Fay Farm uh, recently came out. Um, there's also Palea, um, a new MMO cozy game, which is actually really cool. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot. And I think that's another thing about cozy games. It's not a real genre. <laughs> I think a lot of people, um, you know, you know, would say that some games are cozy, like, for example, The Sims, like some people may not think that's considered a cozy game because it doesn't really fall within the Stardew Valleys or the Animal Crossings of the world. But it's really about like the elements, right? Like there are elements of coziness. Um, so I think that's something that I find really interesting and why I'm so passionate about cozy games right now is that there is no real genre, you know, it's more like subjective, you know, cozy, it means something different for every person. But after like playing so many cozy games, talking with the community, I've learned that there are, yeah, there are some elements that really overlap. So I don't know. I hope one day there is a day that, you know, cozy is a real genre out there in the industry. Yeah. Now my, my daughter, she loves her some animal crossing. Love some Animal Crossing. So, it's a uh, good one. You get lost yeah. in that forever. And then, yeah. especially coming in towards the holidays, you know, if anyone who plays it, like y'all know that Christmas season comes into, <laughs> into play on Animal Crossing. And Christmas is one of my favorite times of the year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited to see that. <laughs> Will you play like multiple cozy games? Because it seems like, like something you get hyper invested into, like if it's the community and the ecosystem you're building. Yeah. You know, you for sure, yeah. I mean, I, some, yeah, I think I play a couple cozy games at the same time. Um, 
yeah, one of them that I'm actually playing right now that I'm obsessed with is Hello Kitty Island Adventure. <laughs> um, you know, that came out recently. I never had an Apple Arcade subscription, but when that came out, I was like, we're getting this subscription. And I really thought I wasn't going to like stay on it, but it's been months. I think it came out in July and I am just like hours into it. It's so much fun. From a, from an ecosystem standpoint, like, uh, cause I, I have Apple, but I don't have Apple Arcade. Like, what, what do you think is the, the best ecosystem? You think it's like Netflix? You think it's, um, of course, you would say Netflix, but, but okay, so let me reframe that question. What about the ecosystem, in your, in your opinion, uh, makes it, you know, good per se? Ecosystem, as in like what platform it should be on? Correct, correct. I mean, anywhere where anyone plays, like there are cozy mobile games, right? I mean, Hello Kitty Island Adventure is definitely one of them. Like, you know, you could play it on your phone. I play it on my iPad, right? I like a bigger screen. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's cozy games to be found anywhere. I have a Steam Deck. Um, and so I'll show you my Steam Deck because it's nice and cozy. It's pink. <laughs> um, and I play, you know, a bunch of... Um, cozy games on my Steam Deck. Um, and yeah, there's, you know, they can be found anywhere. I feel like they should be everywhere, especially Netflix. <laughs> so so tell us about the ecosystem of Netflix. Uh, yeah. What, what games, because when you think of Netflix, like I think of doo-doo and I think of movies and series. Sure. I definitely don't think of, of gaming, right? So uh, so, so what, what's on? Do you still think of DVDs? <laughs> I still think of DVDs. I'll never forget DVDs. <laughs> you know, it's 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 funny. Uh, so we we got into Netflix um, on the DVDs, and I remember like yesterday, it was a, a series called Weeds. I don't know if you guys remember that a series is called Weeds, and we we were, we were into that so much. And then uh, we went to our friend's house, and he had like the streaming part. He was like, "But you just stream it." I was like, "Well, I don't, like you do download it." I don't. He's like, "No, you stream it." And we, he was trying to explain to me. And here I am, like I think I'm hip. I think I'm you know I know about ga games and just about the internet stuff. And like I just did not get like, but you don't download it, but you but you play it, you play it back. So you gotta why do you say no? You just stream it. And like I just I just didn't get it. And then like you know, ten years later, it's like everything is being streamed now. So so uh, so yeah. So you turn. That, that was a funny part about weeds. But. Um yeah. So Netflix does have games. Um I love that this is also the title of this episode. <laughs> Um, it's funny, I get asked that question and it's like my favorite question now. Uh, but yes, Netflix has games, they're all on mobile, all mobile games. Um, and so we actually have, if I'm right, like 79 games, I believe, wow. um, all on mobile. So I know it's really hard to find. I think a lot of people are like, oh, I had no idea. And that's because, yeah, when you think about Netflix, people are mostly on their TVs. Um, but if you do sign in right now, if you're a Netflix subscriber, you can sign into the app on your phone or your iPad or tablet, um, and there'll be a games row, and you are able to download any of our games as long as you're a Netflix subscriber. Um, there's no ads, no monetization, no in-app purchases. You just get the game, uh, which is really cool. And there actually is a cozy game on there right now, um, Spirit Fairer. If any Spirit Fairer fans that are out there, um, that's actually probably my favorite um, cozy game. And so that's on. Uh, the service now. So highly recommend for anyone who's looking to play a cozy game through Netflix. There it is right okay. there. So so what was um, Netflix thought process to get in gaming just to kind of have a revenue you think to kind of bring in more subscribers? Like because I mean, that's a, a great idea. Like we, we think the thought process was to, to in introduce games to kind of put it on the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah, for sure. I think it's just wanting to be, you know, like, well, we are, you know, our mission is to entertain the world, right? And entertainment is everything from watching your favorite film, show, documentary, but also games. Like games is definitely part of the entertainment ecosystem. It's what people spend time on, right? As much as people will sit and binge, uh, you know, all of us who are gamers here, right? Like we all can spend hours, you know, yeah. playing games. And so I think that was really, um, you know, the exciting part of seeing Netflix, um, you know, take on games is just like, yeah, how can we just be like an entertainment, um, you know, hub, right? Where people can watch their films and, and play their favorite games as well. So. And then, uh, cause, I, cause I'm gonna ask all these questions about gaming and Netflix. Yeah. They've been out, they've been getting my money for years, even with the price increase and the shared logins. Well, don't tell nobody, I can't do it no more. Um, so 
uh, the developers of the games, are they some of the producers who make some of the series and movies as well? Or is it like just game developers that's creating games? It's just, yeah, all game developers. Yeah. So when we decided to, um, yeah, take on, you know, take on games, like we um, have, you know, decided to create a studio. So it is actually like a game studio. So we have developers, we have, you know, we acquired studios, things like that. So, um, yeah, so it really is like people who love games, who care about games, who've been in games are making our games. And the reason I ask, I'm thinking about like a revenue perspective. Like, of course, like the big thing last year was Squid Games. Like, I mean, now, now Squid Games is definitely not a cozy game, but uh, but definitely like you know, if if that was created, and then they had like the game, so you could watch the series, and then like have the game effect after that. Like, I think something that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. But uh, I think you had a Squid Game in Netflix games, right? No. No, no, that's good. No, game. no, no. We don't Some have of the IP you have, uh, Stranger Things. Sorry, I'm Stranger okay. Things, and that's actually a really cool thing that you brought up. Is like, yeah, there's, you know, we definitely have thought about, you know, what opportunities there are, right? Like to, um, you know, to, um, yeah, tie IP to games experiences, right? And Stranger Things is like the perfect example, right? So like, I think about like, yeah, we're all waiting for season five to drop, right? Like we're waiting for that, but. There's a couple, I think there's a couple like Stranger Things games um, on on Netflix. And I just feel like, wow, that's a, such a great way to just pass the time, right? Like I'm so excited for Stranger Things, um, you know, to come back. Um, but in the meantime, I can just play a Stranger Things game. Um, and I just think about me as a fan, like as a fan of that franchise, I'm just like, yeah, like, you know, I get to just kind of live in that story and, you know, be in with those characters, you know, in just a different way, right? So, and then when the, you know, when the show comes back on, then it's like, cool, I get to kind of bounce between my my Netflix experiences, right? So like, whether I'm sitting on the couch playing the game, I can also, you know, sit on the couch and watch the show, like when it's, when it becomes available. I think that one of the cooler things too, is that yes, you were part of the founding team to, to launch the recruiting for Netflix games, but Netflix technically has had gamified interactive kind of immersive experiences before then, right? They had like Bandersnatch and there's, my kids love the, what is it? Triviaverse? Uh, uh, not with the cat. Uh, yeah. Keep playing that. It's like stuff, Netflix, if I log in, it's like that all the time. They won't stop playing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I but I think that's really what, you know, Netflix does well, right? Like it gets you hooked, yeah. it gets you into these experiences. Yeah. Um, obviously like, you know, the idea of, yeah, like sitting with your family or with your friends on your couch, right? Like that is still very much core to like, yeah, like how that content is consumed. So that's great. I'm glad that your, your kids love it. Cause yeah, those are, those are really fun. Those are really fun to see. Yeah. Now what, what tripped us out, we did, um, you know, when, when black, when black mirror still, I, I think it's a great, great show, but when they made like the interactive Place. It's like okay, which which one do we pick? Yeah, which what are we gonna do? How yeah, how crazy is this your own gonna adventure, be? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So 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 tell us about about being like a talent recruiter. Like so how how tough is it to, to kind of find talent? What are you guys looking for in talent? And, and kind of how you help spearhead everything with Netflix to create a, a talent industry for for gamers. Yeah, definitely. Okay, a couple of questions in there. How hard is it? <laughs> um, I think being a recruiter is definitely very hard, you know, like there's a lot of moving pieces, right? I think a lot of people think like I just sit down and like read resumes all day. Uh, but really, like the role of a recruiter has changed over years. I've been in the recruiting, um, a recruiter or in recruiting for the past decade. Um, and even in the 10 years that I've been in it, like I've seen a change, like we've gone from being kind of a service, right? People are like, hey, Marie, go fill this role because it's empty, right? Like get a button a seat to <laughs> now where I'm helping build a studio. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm helping be, you know, I'm helping to be a strategic partner with hiring managers, with teams, with you know, producers and designers and developers and engineers and really understanding their goals for like what they want, you know, um, their teams to look like, um, and being able to execute on that strategically, right. And so and I love that, because, again, seeing how recruiting was years ago, where it was more just like a service, now it really is a business ad or value ad, I mean, you know, like, people in the business really trust, you know, um, you know, recruiters to help build 
um, you know, the talent that's going to come into the business and to help the business move forward. Um, so, and that's why I say that it's hard because it isn't just, I'm just trying to fill and find a warm body somewhere. <laughs> like yeah. it really is like, is this, you know, like, what is the role? Like, what does your team even look like today? What do we need? What is missing? How do I fill it? Where do we go? You know, like, what are the types of conversations, you know, we should be having, what are skill sets we should be looking for? Especially since, you know, as you know, the game industry can, move so quickly sometimes like the skill sets like need to move quickly too and so right. um you know really trying to sit with our um you know our hiring managers and our teams to really understand like what they are looking for and what they're building towards like that takes a lot of stuff like that takes a lot of time um and again a true business partnership so um and then to your other question like how has it been you know building it i mean it's been a lot of fun I really appreciate the opportunity to work somewhere like this. So, you know, I've always worked in places that are already established, right? Like they already have here, this is how our recruiting process is. Do it this way, right? And very little ways to actually make impact um, or make changes, right? Uh, but here, even though Netflix has been around for a long time, um, it's been really cool to like be part of a team that is like on the ground floor, like really trying to figure out like, what is it we're trying to build towards? Um, and, and being trusted to do that, right? Like, I think that's a huge part of what I love about my role is that like, I'm trusted by my business partners and stakeholders to really, um, you know, bring in the talent that, um, is going to, you know, be, um, the ones to make Netflix games. So yeah, it's been a really good time. And honestly, I like it. Like, I know that I show up on LinkedIn. I talk about how much I love my job, but like, I absolutely mean it. Like, it is one of the best places I've ever worked. And so glad that I took the leap here. I don't know if we ever wanted to like hear that story, but I took a chance here. And so I'm glad that I did. <laughs> please, please tell us more about that. Yeah, uh, I know, you know, people think about kind of taking a leap is just jumping into entrepreneurship. But sometimes it's jumping from a stable opportunity oh. to an unknown opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. So prior to Netflix, I was at Ubisoft. Um, I was there for about three years. Um, and I grew, I grew a lot there. So I actually left. So I'll take it even step further. I left Lucasfilm. So I used to work at Lucasfilm and Disney. Oh, wow. Star Wars fan, <laughs> as you can see. Star Wars fan, as you can see. <laughs> um, but after Lucasfilm, I actually went to Ubisoft on a contract. I left a full-time gig. Um, you know, one of the best places I could ever work as a true fan of, you know, the Star Wars franchise. And I ended up going to Ubisoft on a contract, on a three-month contract. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so dumb. This is, I can't believe I'm doing this. But it was a chance to to grow and become a recruiter. I actually wanted to be a recruiter. So that's also another interesting tidbit about my career that I didn't fall into it like most people do. I'm like, I want to be a recruiter. Um, and so, yeah, left that, went into the contract. Um, and it was also my first time getting into video games. I, I, you know, I love being at Disney and at Lucasfilm. And I always saw myself being on that more like, you know, linear media side. Um, but it was my first time going into games. Um, and then, yeah, I, you know, I ended up growing there. Like I, I got converted into like a full time, I got promoted, okay. everything. And like you said, Marcus, like I had stability there. Um, and so I really, you know, really, really loved my job there. Um, but uh, the chance to move, you know, definitely came um, coming at my door. Um, I had a very good friend who worked at Netflix um, in the animation studio. And he pinged me and he was like, hey, there's a, you know, they're recruiting for games now at Netflix. I was like, oh, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> and I was like, but also cool, thumbs up, right? Um, and then, yeah, but he was like, yeah, they're looking for recruiters. They're looking for building a, out a studio. What, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I'm fit for Netflix. I actually self-projected very early. I was like, I don't think I'm fit for Netflix. It's very, <laughs> very over there. And yeah. also, you know, I was doing really well at Ubisoft. You know, I literally just got promoted. And so I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to park it here. I don't think I want to leave. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, he convinced me and was all like, yeah, you know, I would love to, you know, refer you, all of that. Um, and then, yeah, TLDR pretty much went through the interview process. I loved it. I thought the opportunity was so cool. 
Um, and, and it was pretty risky because at the same time, I'm like, oh my gosh, Netflix is doing games for the first time. Like how stable is that, right? Like how, how legit is this going to be? Um, but it was an opportunity to, again, like make industry impact, like having worked at Ubisoft and just having this newfound love and passion for video games, um, you know, being able to do it at Netflix. I was like, this, this is just too cool to, to not, to not jump into, um, and so, yeah, so that was me kind of like taking, taking the jump, taking the risk, um, you know, again, like I had everything great going for me at Ubisoft. Um, but yeah, the opportunity came knocking and I had to, yeah, just be a big girl about it. Cause I was really nervous. I was like, I don't know if I'm fit for Netflix, but now I'm glad. I'm just glad that I did. I'm glad that I didn't listen to that voice in my head that said I wasn't good enough for Netflix. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for sharing that story. I have a question. When you, you you work with different groups of people who are trying to get different roles. Do you feel like recruiters do better at at uh, connecting with you for roles because they do that for a living? Like help other people do that? Does that make them like, I'm going to use a Star Wars reference here, like a, a dead eye of connecting with recruiters because they connect with other people? Or, or do you see they have the kind of the same amount of uh, I don't know, even playing field of trying to get a job or a role as anyone else trying to find a job. Right. Mm -hmm. So like recruiters getting a job. Recruiters know what recruiters yeah, are looking for. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. Um, I don't think so. I think there's definitely a level playing field. And it also like is subjective, right? Like, I mean, I've... I've applied for jobs to for recruiters at places and never heard back, right? Like I've been ghosted before. Oh my God, right? Like, like that actually happens. Um, so yeah, I think there's a level of, yeah, you might understand and like, you know, know what the process looks like, but there's just a lot of subjectivity. And I think that's something that I do want people to know is that recruiting is very, very subjective, right? Like as much as there is um, you know, data tied to it. We really do want there to be, you know, more science, you know, to the process. I say there's a lot of art and science when it comes to, um, to recruiting. But even as a recruiter, like, I wouldn't even say that I have, you know, an exceptional chance against anyone else applying for a job just because I know how recruiters work. Um, I've been ghosted before. So I'm like, I also don't know what I did there. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's like there, there's some there's some playing even playing fields for sure. <laughs> that's funny. What uh what, what years was you at Disney? What years what was year I at Disney? Um 2016 to 2018. All right. So so I always like to talk about stocks from here to there. So we're gonna go to Disney. So I think you were the shining star at Disney because when you was at Disney, the stock went up. Um, Interesting. Uh, and, yes, and actually went up literally um, up into 2021 by 144%. So a person had $10,000 per se, they went from 10,000 to you know 24,000. But then, can I can I ask like or can I share like where when I started and like if that could possibly correlate? So when I started at Disney and Lucasfilm, that was actually when Force Awakens came out. So it was like the revival of like Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. Like we hadn't seen any episodes until Force Awakens. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if that had to do anything with it, but that was actually a really cool time to start because, you know, like, you know, you hadn't heard anything from from you know, like Lucasfilm from that at that scale. And then when it was like, you know, the Force Awakens, like we're bringing it back and adding new episodes like I, I don't know. I'm curious if that was probably why. <laughs> I definitely think it has something to do with it. I think, uh, you know, it's perfect timing and, and you help them add a bunch of value. And it, based on that chart, um, you leaving, I think that they missed you. The stockholders missed you. <laughs> Mari, we, we lost, lost your audio a little bit there. Can, you want to try unmuting and maybe mute or mute, unmute? We, we still can't pick up your audio. So while he works on that, I want to, again, give anybody who has any questions for you, uh, Marie, have them, uh, give them an opportunity to uh join in in the conversation share those those questions and we'll answer it for you or for them am i back now you are back hear you okay awesome now i, I was just saying to, to your point when it comes to disney like it's, it's down and and like they're just having a heck of a time finding out what they're going to do next like they're not doing the best with disney plus so they're going to get back into like like the star wars industry so they have a lot of 
a lot of I don't know what to do going on, and it's basically hurting their stock right now. Hmm. Interesting. There's definitely some stuff brewing over there for sure. Um, but you know, I'm rooting for them. <laughs> I'm I'm still rooting for them. Who basically gets Mickey Mouse, right? No, exactly. exactly. No, nobody. Nobody. <laughs> So if you, you talked about kind of the data and the science behind recruiting, if you could say from a percentage standpoint, like how much of, and maybe you can't, what percentage of that process is platform algorithm versus the human element? Because when I talk to folks all the time, I say like, if you see an opportunity on like LinkedIn or Indeed, what I, my advice to them is like, go find the, the recruiters, whoever is hiring, and then like start there first before you put your application in. That's just my standard advice. But, you know, love to hear from your perspective. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's an interesting topic. I think I have no idea where it came from that there is like bots and stuff. <laughs> but again, I've been in recruiting for 10 years and I've looked at every resume that has ever come through. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think... I think there are ways to kind of like filter on the back end, but from from my experience, at least, like I have never seen it like, you know, you apply and then it goes directly to a black hole because you didn't meet keywords or whatever, right? Like, really? Yes, yes. So for me, like you apply, I see it. Like I literally get a ping, an email, I you know, in my ATS system, you know, I see everyone that's come through. Um, and I look at them all. So so really like that's been my experience. I don't know if there are other companies. It could be common practice elsewhere. So for example, like my husband, he works in engineering for, for the city. Um, and for city jobs, they actually do have like knockout questions. So like if you don't have this many years of experience or you don't have an education or in engineering or whatever it is, it actually does automatic you automatically knock you out. Um, but I've only ever seen it there. But again, like tech, entertainment, video games, and I'm sure there are, you know, other, you know, hopefully there are other recruiters and friends that are, you know, watching this and can like definitely vouch for it. Like we spend the time, you know, looking at applications. And so, yeah, that that's all I could say with that one. Like I see them, I see them all. And I can even give you numbers right now for one of my roles. I have uh, about 900 applications. Oh, <laughs> I know that may wow. not be reassuring. I'm so sorry. But yes, like, but I, again, I'm seeing that number. Like that is everybody yeah. who is applying into like this one particular role that I have. Um, and I'm seeing that number and it like grows, you know, as people apply. So, yeah. Well, thank you for adding the humanity back into it. <laughs> I've, I've always heard that, that there's just some bot and yeah. like it scans her keywords and if it you don't have enough of the keywords or the right keywords that you don't even get to a human. Yeah, that's for sure. No, I, again, I have no idea where that came from, but I have always looked at resumes. I look at every single one. Um, I look over them with my hiring manager. So like, you know, sometimes there's multiple eyes on it, <laughs> you know? So yeah, but hopefully that is reassuring to some folks out there that, yeah, I'm looking at them. I see you, I see you all. <laughs> So with that being said, I mean, you can't give away the secrets, but like, what are some hiring hacks individuals that's trying to get into the game industry mm. or just trying to be hired in general, you know, should should teeter from a resume standpoint uh, to kind of make sure that it's more than one eye is looking at their uh, a resume when they apply? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. If we're just talking about the resume, um, you know, that's why job descriptions exist, right? Like, and and I know most companies, you know, really do take, um, what is it? Take their time building the job description because they do, you know, hopefully, you know, the hiring manager knows what they want and all of that, but that's there to help you, right? As the job seeker as well. Um, and so really my advice to anyone who is like, you know, wanting to apply, how do I make my resume look like this? Or, you know, um, get, you know, pass through and have human eyes look at it, it's really important to anchor to the job description, right? Like what are areas of the job description that, you know, our requirements, our skill sets, and what does that look like on your resume, right? Um, and it isn't like just splashing everything onto your resume, 
right? Like that you've ever done in your life. Like, I think there is a way to be strategic in how you build, um, you know, your profile and, and how it stands out. For, so for example, like if you're, um, you know, I don't know, looking to um, apply to like a producer position, right? Like, if you really look at the resume, like a lot of a producer's job is, you know, there's lots of project management, right? Like usually producers need to like corral cats is what I like to say, right? Like they really have to get the team from point A to point B on time, on budget, you know, uh, risk assess, all of that, right? So if that's kind of like the profile and that's just one part of like a producer, right? Like if you're looking at even just one aspect of that per of a producer, what have you done that is similar to that? Where have you corralled cats, so to speak, right? Like, have you done project management? Have you helped a team get from point A to point B? Have you um, been able to stay on budget on projects? Have you been able to assess risk and dependencies on projects, right? Like, have you been able to do that? Because then that now, as a recruiter looking at your resume, I see that as one to one, right? Like even if that even if that wasn't in the industry, like that wasn't even like, you know, a job that you had in the industry, like if you did some of that and you have that skill set, right? Like I'm seeing that as like, okay, cool. Like there's project management now, right? Like in that resume. So that's something I would look at. And again, like that is how I feel like most people can like elevate if you can really tie your, you know, what you've done um to what the the job description is looking for. Now, when you're going through like the applications, can you tell like who's using AI, like ChatGPT or Bard, for instance, to, to kind of do their descriptions or or no, it's really you really can't tell? Um, You know, I think, yeah, it's starting to come out a little bit, especially as someone who plays with like ChatGPT, like I, I play with it a lot. I think uh, I don't know if like many other recruiters do play with it, but I think, you know, if there's any recruiters out there who actually take the time to like understand that technology, um, I actually am seeing it, right? Because I've I've played around with it. I've even played with my own resume, like tell, you know, make my resume, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And I've seen like what it what it spits out. Yeah. And so I do see it. I do see a little bit of it, especially in cover letters, right? Like cover mm. letters seems to be like the cover one where letters. people really, really use like, yeah, whether it's AI or whatever it is, but there's something about it and the way it reads the tone that I'm like, mm. I've read this before. Oh, <laughs> like, wow. Where did I read this before? Right. It starts to sound pretty similar. Um, so it's still, I feel like it's still pretty hard to pick out. You know, I would say that's it's not like every resume, but definitely, you know, after going through like 900 applications, right? Like sometimes you can start seeing like little themes here and there. Mm. Yeah. We have a question that came in from uh, Olivia Perkins. Let me share this so everyone else can see it. it. Says, I'll read it even though you can all clearly see it here. This year has been very difficult for the games industry and hard on me as well as a junior mid animator. How do you see the industry recovering in the next year? whether at Netflix or industry wide? Yeah, that's such a great question. And and yeah, like, let's just take a moment real quick to acknowledge that <laughs> it has been a very tough year uh, for the industry. Um, I actually was recently asked, like, is this even a good time to get into the games industry? And that was such a sad question to hear because I think, you know, it was telling of like, wow, like people are feeling scared, discouraged, you know, it's been a really hard time. Um, and so, you know, yeah, definitely want to take a moment to, you know, just extend my empathy and, you know, my, my, my light and love and pixie dust to all of you who are struggling because it is real. Like what you're feeling, what you're seeing is all super valid. Like I have never seen the industry like this in my time. I actually just talked to a friend today who's been in the industry for 20 years and he even said he's never seen anything like this before. And I mean, sorry if that's like not reassuring, but yeah, like, you know, it is a time, it is a time. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but I think this is also a blip. I actually said this the other day too, when I was attending Games Beat. Um, I think this is a blip. I think there are many you know, we've had many years where there are struggles, right? Like we've seen this um, in the early 2000s, you know, like we've seen things like this happen, um, but they always do get better. And so I think the reality is that the industry is course correcting. As much as that's super hard to like digest, it's course correcting. Yeah. It is realizing after this weird blip the called 
COVID, <laughs> that something happened, right? People made decisions. Um, and now, you know, two, three years later are realizing, oh, it's doing this now, right? Like you were kind of doing this and now we're, you know, we're tapering off. Um, and that's normal, right? And maybe there's even like financial things behind it, like economic things behind it, but it is normal for things to go up and dip back down. Yeah. And so I think it is going to get better. I absolutely think it's going to get better. It's course correcting. Unfortunately, as you're course correcting, there are pain points, right? No one has it right. You know, maybe there is data, maybe there is statistics that people can lean on to make their decisions. But I think there's a lot of art and science, too, right? Because it's not just like one particular, like tangible aspect. There are lots of other human aspects that like we just can't control, right? So I think it's going to get better. Absolutely. It's really hard. Um, I still think it's a great time to be in games. Absolutely. I mean, let's just take a moment too to think about like all the great games that we've gotten this year. All the games we're getting this month alone, October has been wild. Um, you know, I think that's also a telling sign of like the the bright future that is to come. Um, but but yes, I think it's going to change. It, it's only going to get better. It's just right now. Yeah, like we are just in the, the thick of the hardships. Um, but, you know, it'll it'll turn well. And so like, yeah, I think in the next year. Maybe we might still be feeling a little bit of it because course correction as well, like you can never time that, <laughs> right? Sometimes course correction can take, you know, a couple more years. But again, it will course correct itself so that we can like taper off, you know, positively moving forward. So hopefully that answers the question and gives people a little bit of hope. <laughs> yeah. And they, they usually say like typically during like chaos and uncertainty, that's when uh, industries, so from a stock standpoint, but definitely from industries, that's when they blossom. That's when uh, more creators create more. So, um, so, so to your point, it's definitely an uncertainty, just economically, period, you know, between the gaming industry, between the stock market, between life <laughs> right now with all the craziness going on. But definitely, I think we look back, you know, now it's not fun going through it. But definitely, you know, two, three years from now, I think we'll all feel better. I think gamers uh, will feel better. I think the gaming industry as a whole will grow. Uh, but to your point with COVID, that just, I mean, COVID just messed up a lot of things, right? I mean, so even industries that was maybe starting to go down because of the pump up of ideas, money, uh, us being at home doing nothing but playing games, I think that like definitely pumped up the gaming industry maybe a little bit more than what it could have, should have been. Mm -hmm. Now we're kind of going back down. <laughs> yes. If you want to know something super nerdy, <laughs> but if you ever looked into chaos th theory, <laughs> I know you just mentioned chaos, yeah. but if you ever looked into chaos theory, like if you've seen like how it works, it like gets chaotic. And then all of a sudden, and I don't think they've actually figured it out. That's why it's still a theory. Um, but you see on a graph, like it's super just jumbled. It's like, blah, whatever. And then all of a sudden, it just tapers out normal yeah. and they still can't figure out why chaos theory does that. Yeah. But it does that. So <laughs> again, like kind of like using that as like the analogy for like what I'm saying, like it is chaotic, but it will figure itself out. So sorry, that was a super nerdy moment. I love things like that. String theory, chaos theory. <laughs> so yes. Anyways, look it up, look it up, look, look at a graph on chaos theory. It is very wild. To, to see. That's our first homework for the podcast. It's a podcast first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some awesome other awesome questions coming in here. Uh, one from Adrian says, I hear um, that but see almost every posting this, I think, to your previous mm. comment where we talked about uh, chaos theory. Every posting has a minimum requirement of games experience right. or game shift. Mm -hmm. How does a candidate get that initial experience? It's frustrating as someone trying to break in. And if you don't mind, after you answer that, uh, I, I, I'd like to follow up that with, do you see um, more people being let into the industry where this is their first time in the industry or, or is the industry still kind of doubling down on only hiring people who have previous games experience? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So for this, um, yeah, for this question, I think, yeah, there's opportunities to, you know, 
get games experience or even ship your game on your own projects, right? Like I know that sometimes that hard, that's hard. I've definitely heard like the con of that is like, I don't have the money to do this. Like totally understand. Absolutely. I'm not telling you to like go to the bank and get a loan to like ship a game, right? But there are people who have put a little bit of investment into, you know, trying to, yeah, at least gather that skill set, right? So it's it may not be like so much of like this game has shipped, like I went through, you know, pre-production and beta and alpha and like I launched it, right? Like it could also just mean that you have taken the time to understand kind of like that life cycle, like what does that development life cycle look like? What are some areas that you've worked on? Um, and just really gaining that skill set. Like, I think that is a great way to like, you know, just garner that and like, you know, put that on your resume, right? Like, hey, I have taken the time to uh, build that out. Um, to your question, Marcus, yeah, I think I think there's, there's two streams still. I think there's still of the older mindset um, that, you know, yeah, a lot of, you know, maybe some companies, some, um, you know, studios might still be leaning on like, yeah, we just want people who have games experience, right? Like, for whatever reason, you know, I can't speak to them. But I think there is a new stream that is, um, you know, uh, a new stream of thought um, that is coming that it's, yeah, we know how hard it is to get in, right? Like, we know how hard it is to get into the games industry, Studios are starting to see that too. Like, you know, like they're obviously looking at their own, you know, like, um, uh, you know, employer or employees and seeing, yeah, like where are their opportunities, right? Um, and then of course for me, like as a recruiter, like that's something that I am so, 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 you know, um, passionate about is that, is there an opportunity for me to help influence and guide my stakeholders, my hiring managers to think outside of that box if they haven't already, right? Like I've definitely, you know, worked with people who've been, again, in the games industry for like 20 years. I'm like, that's amazing. But, you know, when's the last time you hired an intern, you know? And I'll ask those hard questions. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's both that's happening, you know, the, the old kind of like easier mentality of like, yeah, just hire people who come from games. Um, you know, it's it's just easy to like plug and play. Uh, but I think there is another opportunity that's coming where a lot of, you know, studios, um, developers and, and all of that that are looking to, you know, expand and open their doors um, a little bit more. But there's work to be done there. Right. And like, I think it's it's not just recruiters job. Right. Like, I think hiring managers, stakeholders, leadership. Right. Like people at the top, you know, all that. Like they also need to have that self-awareness. <laughs> Um, and lastly, like they need to have that investment. Like, I think that's the hardest thing, you know, especially me being in, uh, as a recruiter for the past 10 years, um, wanting to implement any type of change, you know, do something differently, you know, change the ATS, whatever it is, right? Like it takes a lot of influence, but um, it is like still, you know, a hard fight, right? Because if my stakeholder is like, Marie, I just don't care. Then I'm like, ah, what do I do there, right? Like, and so like, it, it really does, um, just speak to like, yeah, there's still work to be done, but hopefully that, I know there's a lot of people who are fighting that good fight. So. Yeah. And, and to pick it back off of that. Um, so part of my investment firm, we actually just partnered with a, uh, with a company called Fintology and we basically kind of help, uh, entrepreneurs with funding, um, you know, whether that be like short-term or long-term funding, depending on what their goals are, you know, we're able to kind of get them some type of business credit or, or just something from a funding standpoint. Uh, not like hundreds of thousands of dollars, but, but something that at least will kind of let you kind of have a proof of concept, right? Because we all got an idea, but we kind of need some type of background to have a proof of concept. So, uh, so at my firm, it is something that we're introducing and, and hopefully, um, you know, we can help individuals like this. And I, I don't see the chat, so my apologies, but uh, yeah. a person like that who kind of needs some help to kind of have something proof of concept to have a game ship, you know, that's something that they, we might be able to help with. Totally. And I see the chat as well. Um, hi, Jalisa. Um, thanks for saying game jams. I think that's a great, you know, place to start too, right? Like you're also in a community, right? Like you might be in a community of people who are looking for the same thing, right? So like kind of finding that camaraderie um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up that point, Maria. I think organizations, right? If you haven't like joined organizations, there's so many organizations that are helping to like get those opportunities to you, right? Like, you know, I've, um, you know, have been able to connect with lots of organizations, you know, across the games industry, just, you know, being a, a recruiter. Um, and it's great. Like, it's great to see just like, yeah, like how much is being 
funded and just like, you know, you know, just filter to them to be able to like give opportunities. So I would say, yeah, like game jams, organizations, if you haven't joined them yet. Um, and, and yeah, like just also like finding like mentorship, right? Like I think like being able to like find people who have done it, um, you know, again, you don't have to talk to someone who's been in the industry for 20 years, but maybe someone like, Hey, I shipped a game a year ago. Like that might be the best person to talk to, right. To just see like, how did you do it? Right. Like, how did you learn to do that? And like, get that, um, you know, get that guidance from them. I agree, Maria. I think you know, adding on to that with what Jaleesa said was a, a great suggestion around game jams. You know, I, I think that people sometimes overcomplicate the the term ship the game. Uh, you know, I know there's there's certainly like consoles and PC and, you know, Steam, obviously VR, but there's also platforms like Itch, hmm. right, or Game Jolt, where you can, you can self-publish, uh, and those are typically more indie games, right? You probably won't see anything Star Wars or, or anything from Netflix on, on Itch, but you can publish your own version, basically, of Hello World, right? Just, just a couple of projects, so you can, A, experience the process end-to-end -end going live, right. shipping, like I said, and then B, you can point to something on your resume that says, hey, here's a link to a game that I shipped. It wasn't the most, you know, it's not going to win the game of the year, uh, but I'm a, I'm a single person working on this game, right? It's just a one person team. And this is what I was able to produce. And so I, I want to take what I learned there and then apply it to these challenges and help you achieve your goals. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And I think that also shows things like passion, right? Like being able to like have that drive. Right. Um, and I think that is so telling, too, of like, yeah, like what we look for, right, like in the games industry is like as much as like there's lots of like technical skills and tangible skills people need to have. Like yeah. there's so much, you know, that we also look for from, um, you know, just the soft skills like we really, truly mean it. Like I know sometimes people roll their eyes at me when I'm like, I'm looking for someone passionate. They're like, oh, God, here we go again. You're right. But it's like it's true. Like there is something about like like passion, like for me, I think really means like you will go through the thick of it, but like be happy about it either way, just because like, you know, you're fighting the good fight for something that you truly want. Right. And it sucks. Right. But like, you know, some of the most passionate people like have been, you know, only gotten failures. Right. Like I've only seen that, but because they just love the craft so much, like they will continue to do it. Um, and so I think, yeah, like those are all great suggestions. And I think, yeah, there, there really are a lot of opportunities. Um, and so I'm glad that, you know, whoever that was like asked that question. Um, you know, I think there's, there's so much learning there to, you know, not feel like you're, you're stuck and hopefully, yeah, that was helpful. We have some other uh, excellent questions here. This one's from Ashley Artigas. It says, uh, what do you look for in a cover letter? I know we just talked about yeah. people maybe using too much chat GPT for cover letters. <laughs> continue the rest of the question. I always try to communicate enthusiasm, but sometimes I can sound a bit robotic, especially if other applicants are saying the same thing because maybe they're using chat GPT. Sometimes, uh, and I don't have the full question here. Um, so, so sometimes I want to include a personal antidote, but I don't know if it... I don't know after that. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just answer the first part of the question. What what would you recommend yes. for someone uh, to put in their cover letter? Yeah, for sure. I think the first thing to think about when you're writing a cover letter is like, what do you want to convey, right? Like, what is the story you want to convey? Um, you know, I know there's like a whole like, you know, I think there's two sides to cover letters, right? Some people are like, I hate it. I don't like it. Or like other people like you should have one. Um, I'm kind of neutral. And I think the reason why I'm neutral on cover letters is because I think, yeah, like you have to like convince me and also like you have to be invested in like what you're telling. Right. Because like the reason why some cover letters don't work is because like you, whoever asked that question is that it sounds robotic. Right. Like I'm just doing it because I should do it. And that comes through, right? Like when someone writes a cover letter and they're just like, oh, here we go again. I just have to get this out. Like we can see that, right? Like we can read that. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, it's really, it, it really does sound like, you know, you're of the bunch, right? Like that submit cover letters. But I think, you know, it's a good to stay, take a step back. And for me, like when I think about cover letters, I think of it as my resume can only say so much. Mm -hmm. I can only say so much on my resume. So what I can't say on my resume is what I want to say on my cover letter. Like, I really think that the cover letter is like that additional voice that you can't put on your resume. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, I look at my resume sometimes and I'm just like, God, it looks so boring. Like, you know, it's plain. I've only, you know, I've used the same resume for the last 10 years and there's nothing cool about it. But anytime I've written a cover letter, it's like, how do I thread my story? Right. Like, how do I uh, really exude enthusiasm and just like passion and, you know, again, like relevant um, experience as well. Um, so really, that's how I think about it. And, you know, hopefully other people can think about it that way is like, you know, use the cover letter to say things that you probably can't say on your resume that you are excited to tell someone. Right. And I think, yeah, that's how you also get it to be not like everyone else. Uh, because like when I read cover letters that are just like so excited, you know, like they just love the opportunity. They're also proud of their own accomplishments. Right. Like they're also proud to share who they are. Right. Not just like I'm a project manager and I've done this and, I, you know, I've got this many sales, blah, blah, blah. But it's more so like a good balance of this is what I've done, but this is who I am. Like, I think that's what really stands out. Right. Because, again, like use your cover letter to like say things that you probably won't be able to do on your resume. Mm. Yeah. We've got a, a very similar follow up question and, and I have a part two to that. Sure. So this other question from Michael says, how long should a cover letter typically be? And after you answer that, how long do you recommend that a resume should oh, be? Oh, goodness. One page, two page, seven pages. Oh, God, these are fighting <laughs> words. I'm <just> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long a cover letter should be? I think that should typically just be, you know, a, a page at most. Um, really for me, I think about quality over quantity. Like, again, like, are you able to convey your story, share who you are, um, you know, in a way where, you know, yeah, like it doesn't have to be like, you know, so, so long, right? Like, are you hitting on points that are relevant to the job you're applying for shows, you know, how you show up, um, and, you know, kind of brings it all together concisely. Like, I think those are more of the successful, uh, cover letters. Uh, resumes. Um, I don't know. I, I'm really like, I, the worst resume I've ever seen was 20 pages long. So anything that's not 20 pages long, that's the answer. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> no, um, wow. 10 pages is good. Like, I don't, I don't, I honestly, like I've been looking at resumes for 10 years. I don't balk at, at length that, but that's just me. And again, that's subjectivity, right? Like, that's just me. Um, you know, yeah, I've seen one page resumes to like three page resumes and it's fine, right? Like as long, again, as long as it tells me the story too, of like, what am I looking at? Like, are these all relevant? If you're the 20 page resume I seen had zero relevance. I didn't even know what I was reading. Right. But like, if someone gives me one page and it tells me exactly what I need, you're fit for this job, you've got their qualifications great, right? If you could tell me that in three pages, also great. Like, it really is like, are you anchoring towards, you know, the job, right? So yeah, that's, that's my answer. But definitely don't don't do 20 page resumes like that. I don't know. I honestly like, I don't know what it was like. It was like every everything they've done under the sun. It was really strange. Anyways. <laughs> Now, was that a resume or a pamphlet? Like, which which one was it? It started, okay, it started as a resume. Page one was a resume. And then all of a sudden, there were, like, publications, citations, and it started to look like a paper. It's like, maybe they just combined a paper with their resume and, like, didn't know it. But it was very strange. When you see resumes, do you prefer to see the ones that have maybe some character in it or like black and white left aligned? Does that, that impact like your perception of the resume? It doesn't, doesn't. Again, I'm very much of like, what is, yeah, what are the qualifications? What is on the resume that I can read that tells me? And, and that's the thing. Like when I look at resumes, like I'm also like, I have the job description in front of me, right? Like if I'm going to look at producer resumes today, I got my producer job description. I'm like, okay, that's what I'm anchoring to. That's what I'm looking for. Right. And so, yeah, like it really, to me, it doesn't matter. Um, I think sometimes folks will be like, oh, I'm in the creative industry, right? Like I do video games and I do game design. Like, should I do that to my resume? You can, but I don't think it really makes or breaks it. Like, I think, again, it's all about, like, is it the right information, right? Like, is my job description, like, matching with what you have? Um, and that's how I just move forward. Okay. And then a quick follow-up from Steven. And I want to, we got some earlier questions definitely yes. want to get to. 
Um, how much time do you spend reviewing a resume? I, I think I saw online maybe 10 years ago that is like the average is like six seconds, 10 seconds. Wow. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Average they say is like um, seven seconds or something that a, res, a, so a recruiter would look at a resume. Um, I really try not to do that. Like I really do try to like, again, like read what I can, you know, I really, um, you know, try to focus on like, again, the skill sets, right? Like, again, if I'm looking at my job description, I'm, you know, looking for something similar. Producer needs to be project, you know, needs to have project management experience, budgeting, uh, you know, whatever, go to look at the resume and like, I'm looking for that, right? Like, is there anything that tells me about someone's project management skills, their budgeting skills, <laughs> you know, can they corral cats? Awesome. You know, like those are the things that I really look for. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel like I take a little bit more time than, you know, a couple seconds. I also feel like maybe the couple of seconds too is like just for maybe recruiters who have also been in the industry long. Like, I feel like I've, only, I've looked at resumes all my career that like, I kind of like, I don't know, it's like laser eyes. Like I could like, I could read like a resume pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so I think like maybe that's where the, the statistic came from. But yeah, I try to, I typically try to take my time and just make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm getting the, the skill sets that I need. Okay. Yeah. Noah has an awesome question here. Uh, networking is a fundamental part. Oh, I lost that question. One second. Did it show up? I think it showed up. Okay. Networking is a fundamental part of marketing yourself in the industry. As a recruiter, what kind of connection are you most likely to respond to? Yeah, that's a great question. Oh, I feel bad for this because I am horrible at responding <laughs> on my DMs. Marcus, you probably have like, you know, experienced this, like trying to get me on the show. I'm all like, I'm so sorry. Like I ignored you for like a month. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, like I, my, my DMs on, on LinkedIn is like a hot mess. Like it is, it is very hard to respond to everyone. I do go through it. I will say that, like, I will go through it. I think the um, the ones that, yeah, like the ones that I respond to, or at least the ones that I like, you know, will get in front of my hiring manager. Again, same way as I was like, as I would like look at a resume. Like, if you sent me a connection and you said, "Hey, Marie, you know, hope you're doing well. Saw that I that you had this role. I applied to it. Here's a couple things on why I'm a good fit. Um, you know, thanks for the consideration." Even if I don't respond, like I do typically will find your application. Oh my God, yay, someone's looking at it. Um, you know, I actually go into my ATS, I go look it up. Okay, let me look up Marcus. Um, I'll pull up the resume um, and, you know, I'll take a look and I'll look at it. And if it's, again, someone that, you know, could potentially be a good fit, you know, I move that forward, right? I get second eyes on it, maybe send it to, you know, my hiring manager. Um, you know, I have, you know, other recruiters on my team. Sometimes I'm all like, you know, what do you think about this? I just want to make sure. Um, but, but yeah, but those are typically the ones that I at least move forward on. Again, I'm not like the best at responding to everyone, but I do see like, if there are people who are interested in my positions, like I will go that extra step of like, let me go find them. You know, I, I, you know, it's just my due diligence. I'm like, let me go find them. Let me pull the application. Let me review it. And then if it makes sense, then, you know, we'll move forward on it. So when you're looking at resumes, how much social media stalking are you doing? Are you doing it when you first look at the resume or as they kind of go through the channels of having the first interview, the second interview, the, the final shake my hand or not shake my hand interview? <laughs> like when, when are you starting to, to slide in their Instagram or, or their, their social <laughs> Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't really, um, you know, social media stalk. I really just go as far as um, LinkedIn. I will say if it comes to more like artist roles or designer roles that like there's portfolio, like that's kind of like the next step. Um, I think that's a very interesting and fine line um, that I'm very sensitive of. Again, just me as a recruiter, right? Like not that this is a policy for any of the companies that I work for, but as a recruiter, I really do think like, what is that going to tell me? And what is that going to tell me about this person and their ability to do this job? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, cause at the same time, I'm like, you know, I don't have Instagram anymore. But if you saw me a couple of years ago, you'd probably be like, how the hell did she get to Netflix? You know, like what shenanigans was she up to? You know, but, you know, <laughs> again, like that's kind of what I think about. Like, you know, whatever you do in your private life or your personal life, like, you know, I, I'm very mindful of like how to be sensitive about that um, and just making sure, yeah, like, you know, I'm not just doing it just to do it, but like, is it going to be valuable? 
right? Is it going to be valuable to me? Is it going to be valuable in how I vet the candidate for their qualifications? Um, you know, like I, I really do think about it from like a competency perspective and not like a personality perspective because the personality stuff like that comes out during the interviews, right? Mm -hmm. Like I feel like people's true selves really come out in the interviews. So I rather find out that way, I guess, than, you know, find out another way. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. We've got a question from Steve Fowler, who teaches a class at USC. Yay. Hi, Steve. The master's students looking to break into the games business. Does Netflix have intern programs or graduate programs? Yes, we do have an intern and graduate program. Um, I think, yeah, I think if you go on the career side, there's actually a tab for early careers, I believe. Um, and there is a team. There is like a whole team um, of dedicated folks who are just specifically looking for interns for Netflix. And there is a new grad program as well. So I think for those who like are either going to graduate or like about to graduate, um, you know, and the criteria are all there. So yes, absolutely check out that that's part of the career site. Excellent. Thanks for that. We have two more questions. I want to hold you. We have two more short questions. This one's from Carl and says if the same job is reposted several times, is it worth reapplying if you did not get an interview the first round? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think reposting, um, you know, um, there could be a lot of things that are happening on the back end that you may not get the, you know, full story on, obviously. Um, I don't think it hurts, you know, to to reapply, honestly. Um, you know, I am mindful of saying that, though, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, if I reapply, then I'm reinvested and, you know, I'm hoping for something. I'm setting up expectations. So it really is up to you. I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't. Uh, I'm just going to say that it's it's fine to. Right. Um, but but yeah, but one caveat I will say is. Yeah, like I guess it depends like how how soon like that might have been reposted, because sometimes it could just be a fluke, right? Like it could just be like, oh, there might have been a glitch. Sometimes the repost could also mean they're hiring for two people, right? Like, oh, like I've seen this producer like three times and it could be like, maybe they're hiring for three producers, right? Like, I don't know. Um, you know, it could be those. Like I've definitely had, you know, experiences like that, um, you know, on the posting side where like I'm posting things and I'm like, okay, this looks like I'm, you know, I'm spamming, but it could be that they might be different too, right? Like they could be slightly different, maybe same title, different expertise, maybe different years of experience. Um, so I would also just be mindful of like, is it the same exact job? Um, you know, is it the same exact job on the same exact team? If you do know that, uh, or same studio or whatever it is. So I would, yeah, I would just like be mindful of, yeah, like what the posting looks like. Um, but I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't, but you know, it's there. Yeah. If it's there, it's there. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would definitely caveat like, so with my investor firm, we've hired uh, financial advisors, support staff, and like two times we reposted, and the second time around, both people that are still with us today were just better candidates. So uh, you don't know if you're gonna make or miss unless you shoot your shot. So I would definitely say, um, you know, I would say definitely do it. Yeah, for sure. And then we have one more question. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. Uh, this is from Mike Ligon. Says I recently came across an HR coordinator role and feel like I wouldn't be considered due to a background mostly in marketing com and communications okay. roles. What skills would be needed to work in an entry level recruiting role? That's a great question. I think marketing and communication is totally part of being in like an HR position, right? Like obviously communication, like got to be spot on with that. Um, you know, in HR. Um, and I think HR, yeah, like they, they have some um, skill sets that I feel like are very resonant in, in marketing positions. So if anything, yeah, like I feel like it's really how you translate it, right? I think anyone who is like, yeah, trying to do that type of pivoting, which I've been seeing a lot lately too, um, it's, yeah, like it's not that you don't have any skill sets for a recruiting role, right? But like, how does it translate? Like for me, like, I like to say that I unofficially do marketing for Netflix games, right? Like on my LinkedIn, like I'm not a marketer at all. I, you know, I have no idea how that actually works, but you know, just because of like my passion, my love for, for Netflix games, um, you know, I, I'm 
market the way that I do, right? Um, and like that helps me as a recruiter because like I'm getting the word out. People, you know, Netflix has games, that's so cool, right? And I'm able to like bring them into like my ecosystem, right? Into my network. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, you know, if you have a marketing background, communication background, and you want to get into recruiting, that is absolutely, you know, um, something you can do. Um, and, and yeah, and if you do have a marketing background, there are roles that are actually like talent marketers, right? Like they are specifically um, kind of what I do a little bit, you know, with Netflix games where it's like, yeah, I'm trying to invite people into the ecosystem. I'm trying to build like a... Um, a talent community, right, of folks that like are interested in Netflix games. How do I engage them? How do I share my jobs with them? Things like that. Like there are actual talent marketing jobs. So like if you already are a marketer at heart, you know, trying to get into recruiting, you know, there are opportunities for that for sure. So I think it's just how you translate it, right? So I wouldn't say like you are entry level in that sense. I think it's just like, how does it how does it relate back to the job, right? Like, so if you're marketing X thing, how would you market, you know, in a recruiting position, right? Like if you're doing comms on one thing, like how does that translate to being a recruiter? So, yeah. Well, that was the last question. Thank you again. Uh, thank you all for such excellent questions. Um, I, I learned a lot. I'm sure Mario did as well, and, and hopefully oh, yeah. many of you did. Uh, we, we appreciate your time. Before we go, we have two last things for you. Number one, um, let us know how we can support you and what you're doing or what Netflix has coming up. If I don't know if you have another event coming up between here and in the year. Um, and then if you don't mind, if you will select the person who asked the best questions or the most questions, whatever resonated with you, we would love to grant that person a free digital copy of Mario's book and, and my book as well. Yeah, for sure. Okay. In terms of supporting, um, Go play a Netflix game. Do that. Go on Netflix and go play a game. Uh, again, it's on mobile. Uh, go and do that. I think, um, you know, if you haven't looked at our games yet, again, I think we're at like almost 80 games. And there, I think there's going to be something for everyone. So absolutely want to like plug that. Um, you know, y'all know that I run my mouth on LinkedIn. So, you know, feel free to support that as you see that. Uh, you know, I am really passionate about being a recruiter, but also I just love this industry so much. Um, and so, yeah, so really just supporting me on all things that are video games, you know, I think as a, also as a woman and a underrepresented woman, like I, um, you know, what, what, what did you say, Mario? I'm aggressive. So like, I, I want to be aggressive in this space. Um, so, you know, definitely, you know, find time to support content there. Um, and then, and if you like playing cozy games and, you know, talking about cozy games, I am your person. Like, I hope, um, I think the one thing that I love again about cozy games is like the community, like there is just such a wholesome and kind community, but not just because of the games, but I think there's true friendship and love and light in there. Um, and that's what I'm all about. So those are, those are my plugs. And then for who it will get your books, um, I would love to select Olivia Perkins. Um, she was the one who asked the question about how hard it is, you know, to be in this or, you know, to find a role in the industry as it is right now because of how hard the year has been like that. I just I feel that so much like I, you know, I'm really trying to do my best in any way that I can to support folks. But again, it is real. It is real that there are struggles out there and it is a hard time, but I really hope that you find the light and, you know, the love for, for the industry and the passion and that again, things will get better. So, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm just sending extra love to Olivia. So. Thank you for that. So we appreciate your time. We're, again, we, everyone, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Mario, where can people find um, what you're working on to support you? Yeah, yeah, just uh, just hit me up. Uh, just Google uh, either Mario Payne uh, or uh, my Instagram, Painful Profits, because when you make money, it can be painful. So P-A-Y-N-E-F-U-L Profits or, or my Instagram, Relax Investor, information about my book and my speaking engagements and all the fun stuff we're doing in the community. Excellent. Excellent. And then next week we have Vanessa uh, Lane and Michael from Better Play Studios. They are a gaming studio that builds games that help you deal with mental health mm -hmm. or mental stress. So really excited to have that conversation. So I hope you will join us next Thursday, uh, November 2nd. 
And before we go, again, if you want to learn how to leverage video games, game-driven engagement to unlock engagement across your entire community, maybe for your brand, I have free training here, bit.ly slash game-driven brand growth. Um, I want to I'll teach you about the video game industry. I teach you why two-thirds of Americans play video games. And I cite very specific examples of brands doing that successfully. So with that, thank you again for your time. We'll see you again next week. We help you level up your wealth. See you later. Peace. Peace. Bye, y'all. Thank you.